Hello, best friends. It's so lovely to see your face again. I hope this week is treating you super well so far, and I am just thrilled to be hanging out with you again in this safe little space that we have created for ourselves here. I don't know why I had to make that so awkward and painful for us, but the main takeaway here should be that I am very happy to be hanging out with you again. If you have just randomly stumbled across this video and you've never seen my face before, then hello, my name is Liz and it is so lovely to meet you. And if you like talking about things, if you like talking about things like true crime and unsolved mysteries, then you should most definitely hit subscribe so that you and me can be best friends forever. You know, if you want but just so you know, we're best friends now. And whether you are new here or you're here all the time, I would just like to take the opportunity to point out that I don't have a regular upload day. I tend to just upload whichever day, whichever hour I have a video ready. So you should probably hit the bell as well so that you don't miss out on any fun little hangout dates like this one. As usual, of course, we are joined by our other best friend, Lily, here to give us very important top-notch emotional support and interrupt us probably with some background noises just randomly sprinkled around. So editing Liz, let's switch to Lily Cam. You're such a good girl. <laughs> so today I am covering my first Canadian case. Shout out to all my Canadian best friends. Don't worry, I will not be attempting any Canadian accents in this video, mostly because I already tried off camera and it was way too pitifully bad, even for my own ears. Sorry about that. See? I, okay. I swear that's it. This case was suggested to me a while ago by the lovely Jessica from the province of Newfoundland and Labrador. And I put a lot of effort into making sure I pronounced that correctly, but I'm pretty sure I'm still not getting it right. But just from the name of it, it sounds like the most magical place ever. And then you look at pictures and you're like, geez Louise, it is freaking gorgeous. If I'm being honest, part of me did expect there to just be groups of random Labradors just running around together free. And that's not the case, but it is still beautiful. I told Lily about it and I'm pretty sure she's added it to her bucket list of places to visit before she dies. Right. You want to visit, don't you? You want to go and see all the Labradors? I haven't told her yet about there not being just random Labradors running around. Don't, don't tell her yet. Today's case is from 2017, so my music listening didn't have to change that drastically from what I would listen to on a day-to-day -day basis. I am admittedly like a few years behind what the kids are listening to these days anyway. But according to Spotify, 2017 Liz was listening to a lot of Look What You Made Me Do by Taylor Swift, also Praying by Kesha and Havana by Camila Cabello. I know I quite literally have the music taste of a 16 year old girl, but I'm also shameless and I don't care. <laughs> you guys should definitely have a look on Spotify or Google and tell me what you were listening to in 2017, because I'm pretty sure it will be way cooler than what I was listening to. But on with the actual case, today we are talking about the unsolved disappearance of Courtney Lake, who was 24 years old when she went missing under some seriously disturbing and frustrating circumstances in June of 2017. So here is the disclaimer for today's video. I know sometimes disclaimers can be annoying, but I still just like to give you guys a heads up on some of the topics we're going to be talking about today. So no one's caught off guard because I'm not here to traumatize anyone. And on top of the disclaimer, just be aware that today's case is an unsolved one. There is no closure for anyone. So you are going to feel that in the pit of your stomach by the time we are done here today. Courtney Lake was last seen on the 7th of June at 7.54 p.m. on Michener Avenue in the city of Mount Pearl in Newfoundland and Labrador. At the time of her disappearance, Courtney had long dark hair. She was wearing glasses and a grey jacket, pink hoodie, plaid pink shirt, black pants and Nikes with pink laces. But before we get into the circumstances of her disappearance, we are going to talk about who Courtney was, starting with her childhood. Courtney was born on the 12th of February, 1993, in a small town called St. Lawrence in New Finland to her parents, Sean and Lisa Lake. And we're gonna be talking a fair bit about Lisa in this video. Firstly, she was Courtney's mother and they were very close. So she was a big part of her life. And 
secondly, because a lot of the extra information I was able to gather came from an interview that Lisa gave to the guys at Nighttime Podcast when they did a two-parter episode on Courtney's disappearance. So basically, long story short, remember Lisa. She's Courtney's mother and she's going to come up quite a few times in this video. Courtney had a younger brother, Colin, but she was the first grandchild to Lisa's side and the first granddaughter to her father, Sean's side. So it's very safe to say that she was definitely the golden child. She was very loved. And if we're being real, spoiled. Like Lisa said, if she ever said no to Courtney as a child, when she wanted something, Courtney's response would just be to say, well, I'll just go ask my aunt or my nanny because she knew chances were she'd get it. Growing up, Courtney was described as quite the character. She was spunky. She was a free spirit and she was very funny and outgoing. She could always make you laugh. And if any one of her loved ones needed something, she had their back. She was there. She was also really creative. She did a graphic design course in school and actually made up posters for businesses around town. And she also designed one of her tattoos, which was an exploding star on her neck. When Courtney was a teenager, her parents, Lisa and Sean, split up and Lisa moved a three and a half drive away from St. Lawrence to a city called Mount Pearl. And it's said that after this split, Courtney managed to stay really close with both of her parents, but she chose to move to Mount Pearl with Lisa. When she was in her late teens, though, Courtney was back in St. Lawrence for an event, and it was then that she met a man named Jason Pike, and the two of them started dating. Jason was about 10 years older than Courtney, and Lisa says that this relationship was just a teensy bit volatile. In fact, if we're being real, in that interview that I mentioned just before, Lisa said that Jason was a raging lunatic who had multiple charges against him when he and Courtney started dating and that the relationship was very on and off again and that there was even a bit of violence involved. But she didn't even know that they were dating before she found out that Courtney was pregnant and that she was going to be a grandmother. <laughs> Lily's just like messing with all my shit right now. Are you checking out the new setup? What do you think? Uh, please don't knock that over. Are we a little bit needy today, hey? You Ooh. just want cuddles. You are molting and it's just going everywhere. Courtney's son, Oliver, was born in 2011. And by this point, she and Jason had been seeing each other on and off for about four years. But not long after Oliver was born, the two of them called it quits for good. Jason says that this split was due to Courtney's own personal demons. And he did end up getting full custody of Oliver. And it seems like this point in Courtney's life was very turbulent and a bit all over the place. She struggled with addiction to drugs and was involved in just not a great group of people, it sounds like. But in 2013, Courtney made history as the first single mother to get into the Miss Newfoundland and Labrador pageant. And this was a huge deal because she and Lisa had fought tooth and nail to be able to get her in. And Courtney didn't actually end up placing, but Lisa says that when she and Oliver went that day and watched Courtney on stage, her daughter was just proud as punch and nothing could have wiped the smile off her face that day. And from what I can gather, it was around the time of this pageant that Courtney made the decision to start sorting her life out. And she made it her goal to become a stable and solid presence in Oliver's life. And she achieved this, especially in the year leading up to her disappearance. By 2017, when Oliver was six years old, Courtney was taking him to swimming lessons every week along with his father, Jason. And she and Jason would often take Oliver to the park to play together. And she would FaceTime him every day, if not every other day, quite often before he went to school. And these calls from his mum was something that Oliver seriously look forward to and hung out to. They were a huge highlight of his day. And then in early 2017, Courtney met a 25-year-old man named Philip Stephen Smith and she was still living with Lisa in Mount Pearl at this point and she told Lisa all about this guy she had met online and he was 
really nice and he had his own house and his own pickup truck and his own motorbike and the list just went on and on and on. Philip was an army reservist and he worked away for about three weeks at a time in what sounds like a laborer position, but he lived in an area called St. John's, which was very close to Mount Pearl. And from very, very early on in this relationship, when he went to work, Philip would give Courtney his keys so that she could stay at his place while he was gone. So the two of them moved very quickly and things got toxic very quickly. Lisa and her husband, Danny, weren't Philip's biggest fans from the very beginning. I don't know if there was some kind of disagreement that occurred or if they just got bad vibes from him, but they just were in general unimpressed. And Philip was quite often in contact with Lisa, it sounds like, which I guess makes sense with Lisa being Courtney's mother. But basically there were just red flags popping up all over the place for Lisa when it came to Courtney and Philip. You know, all of her mama instincts were telling her that this was not going to end well. And then one night at about 3 a.m., she got a phone call from a very upset Courtney who wanted her to come pick her up from Philip's house. And that night there was this crazy snowstorm that Lisa and Danny had to struggle to drive through to get to Philip's place. But then when they get there in the middle of this insane snowstorm, Courtney is sat outside on the front steps just waiting for them. Like that's how bad things had gotten in that house with Philip. So that's how Courtney and Philip's relationship was going. And things between Lisa and Philip weren't going much better. Like I said, I don't know if there were any altercations or conflict going on in the background that we don't know about, or if this was just Philip being Philip. But around this time, Philip said something really disturbing to Courtney that she told Lisa about later. What he basically said was that this was all a game. And if Courtney got Lisa to pick her up from his house, then she had won. But if Philip got Courtney back to his house, then he had won. You know, so we're just seeing some dynamics here that are just a little bit troubling. And this was still only a few weeks into Courtney and Philip seeing each other. But after that incident on the night of the snowstorm, Courtney continued to see Philip and their relationship just got more and more messed up. And things reached a peak on the 15th of April when Philip assaulted Courtney in his truck near his house in St. John's. And Lisa reported this incident two days later on the 17th of April to the authorities, to the Royal Newfoundland Constabulary, or the RNC, as I'll be referring to them from this point on, because I can hardly say constabulary. But this assault, the way it was reported in the media and the way Lisa talks about it, you would think we're talking about two different events. In the media, it was said that when the RNC turned up to the Lake residents to investigate this reported assault, Courtney told them that this altercation had occurred when she had tried to get out of Philip's truck and he had tried to stop her by punching her twice, once in the stomach and once in the arm. And it was said that Courtney complained to the officers of a bump to her left eyebrow a sore arm and a cut to her inner lower lip that she had suffered as a result of this altercation. But if you listen to Lisa talk about this assault, this like small, tiny, insignificant bump on Courtney's eyebrow was actually the size of a baseball. And Philip had not only punched Courtney, but had also literally chucked her out of his moving truck on the busiest road in St. John's. But Courtney did continue to see Philip after this assault, even after her mother obtained a peace bond on him. And for those of you like me who don't live in Canada and are like, what is a peace bond? From what I have gathered in my research is it's kind of like a restraining order, but also kind of not. To give us just a quick Wikipedia breakdown, in Canadian law, a peace bond is an order from a criminal court that requires a person to keep the peace and be on good behavior for a period of time. This essentially means that the person who signs a peace bond must not be charged with any additional criminal offences during its duration. Peace bonds often have other conditions as well, such as not having any weapons or staying away from a particular person or place. So the person who has the peace bond filed against them, I guess, has to sign a piece of paper saying that they won't break any restrictions of the peace bond. And this is in their benefit because if they sign the peace bond, they can quite often avoid 
a criminal trial or being convicted of whatever they were charged with. But if they break the restrictions of the peace bond, the person risks a big fine or even jail time. So there we go. We all learned something new today. I love that for us. Go team. Hey, we all learned something new. Hey, you ready to go be a lawyer in Canada? Am I boring you? Sorry if anyone else feels the same way as Lily, but I personally like learning new things, okay? So in this peace bond that Lisa now had against Philip, he had agreed in writing to not contact her, to not show up at her house or anywhere else that he knew she was going to be. And not long after this, Philip took out his own peace bond against Courtney because of this teensy little episode where he had lured Courtney to his house with the promise of drugs, something he would do on a regular basis and something that seemed to be a key factor in why Courtney continued to see him. But this particular night when Courtney showed up at Philip's house, she found out that he didn't have any drugs. And so she got just a little bit angry and broke one of the windows on his pickup truck. And Philip, not long after this, called authorities on Courtney for breaking this peace bond and being at his house. And Courtney was taken into lockup and had to be bailed out by Lisa the next day. So basically everything was getting very messy and even more toxic than it had ever been, if that was possible. And then on the 5th of May, 2017, Philip made a phone call to Lisa, despite that peace bond that he had signed saying that he wouldn't contact her. And so Lisa contemplated not answering this phone call at all, but she eventually decided to pick up. And this proved to be an incredibly fateful decision that would haunt Lisa for years to come. In this phone call, Philip told Lisa that he was going to end his own life and Lisa straight away knew that he was serious. And so she called his sister who called the RNC and asked them to do a welfare check on her brother. And so the RNC used GPS on Philip's phone to track him. And when they found him, he was sitting in his truck on a road near the airport. But when Philip saw them, he took off and this resulted in a quick chase, but police very quickly lost him. However, they were still determined to make sure that he was okay. So a little while later, they used his GPS to track him again, and they found him about a half hour drive south near a pond in his truck in Conception Bay South attempting to commit suicide. And so Philip was immediately taken into custody and he was placed into a healthcare facility for four days. And during this four days that he was in custody, Courtney wasted no time getting a peace bond on Philip for herself. So now not only was Philip legally not permitted to contact Lisa, her mother, but he was now not allowed any contact whatsoever with Courtney herself. On the 8th of May, after this four day stay at the healthcare facility, Philip was released. But now not only did he have charges against him of assault, he also had charges of dangerous driving and evading police. So his driver's license was revoked. So when Philip came before a judge, he said that this wasn't going to work for him. He needed to get to and from work. So the judge, being in a kind mood, obviously, put an exception where Philip would be able to drive between his home and work. And that was it. And then Philip was like, well, me not being able to contact Courtney isn't really going to work for me either because we're very much in love and we would like to continue our relationship. You know, despite the peace bond that Courtney had filed against him just days earlier and the charges he was facing for assaulting her. So the judge obviously said no to this request, but this did not seem to bother Philip very much. Not long after he was released, Philip found out that Courtney was seeing someone new, a guy named Brian, who happened to be her godfather's son. So someone she was already very close with, and they had now entered into a romantic relationship. So she was putting up just a ton of posts on Facebook featuring her new boyfriend, Ryan. And Philip, seeing all of these posts, was seriously pissed. Like, I think 
up until this point, he honest to God believed that he and Courtney were still an item. And so faced with this serious betrayal on Courtney's part, he decided that the only logical response would be to lash out by sending intimate images he had of Courtney to her new boyfriend, Ryan, through Facebook. Images that Courtney had meant to just be for Philip. And this on its own would have been horrific enough, but Philip then went on to send these images to Courtney's brother, to her dad, her stepdad, to her uncles, pretty much every male relative she had. Absolutely sickening. And Courtney, obviously distraught, reported Philip to the authorities for distributing these images of her without her permission that had been meant for only him. But it seems like no real action was taken at this point. Like it was just added to the ever-growing list of charges that Philip was steadily racking up. On the 5th of June, two days before she went missing, Courtney needed to make another phone call to authorities because Philip had called her and Lisa 33 times that day. So we can now add harassment to the list. And Philip once again was in complete violation of the peace bonds against him, saying that he could not contact Lisa or Courtney. So obviously Philip had reached the stage where he just did not care at all anymore. Nothing was going to stop him. And then when authorities were still on the way to the house responding to that first phone call, Call, Courtney needed to call them again and say that Philip had shown up at the house and that after some big dispute, he had just taken off in a mad rage. When the RNC found Philip, he was quite literally circling Courtney's neighborhood, clearly having no intention of honoring the peace bonds and staying away. And so he was placed under arrest and he was in jail for two days before he was back in court to finally face the music. And this brings us to Wednesday, the 7th of June, 2017, the last day Courtney was ever seen. That morning, Philip appeared in court facing a multitude of different charges, including, of course, assault against Courtney. And Courtney actually appeared in court to testify against him, which was such an incredibly brave and scary thing to do on Courtney's part. Like she sat there in the courtroom and told the judge all about the assault, the photos, the harassment, and she did all this in front of Philip. But I think Courtney was at this point now where she just wanted the whole thing over and done with. She was ready to have Philip out of her life for good. After testifying, Courtney left the courthouse, probably equal amounts of relieved and terrified, knowing that she had now done everything she possibly could, but also knowing that things were now out of her hands and she would now just have to wait and hear what the judge's verdict would be. At about 2.45 p.m., she was picked up by Jason Pike, her ex, to take their son, Oliver, for his weekly swimming lessons. And at 3.07 p.m., she was captured on CCTV at an Esso gas station in the middle of St. John's. And it's just a short video. Courtney literally walks in, walks to the counter and makes a purchase and then walks out. But in the footage, we can see the last outfit that Courtney was seen wearing and also that she's alone and she looks perfectly fine at this point. After Oliver's swimming lesson, Jason says that he dropped Courtney back at her mother's house at about 4 to 4.30 p.m. And according to Jason, this was the last time that he ever saw Courtney. Now, coincidentally, it was around the same time that Philip, Courtney's other ex, was walking out of the provincial courthouse in St. John's after his hearing. And yes, you heard me correctly. Philip wasn't being transported to jail to serve out whatever sentence he had been handed down by the judge. No, he was walking out on his own, free as a bird. So at his hearing, Philip pled guilty to assaulting Courtney, to distributing those images of her without her consent, and to a list of driving-related offences. And he was also found guilty of breaching the peace bonds that Courtney and Lisa had in place against him. And his defence attorney told the judge that Philip pleading guilty to these charges showed that he was genuinely remorseful for his actions and also said that he had personally promised her that he would never contact Courtney again. 
His attorney also pointed out that prior to all of these charges that Philip had racked up in the last three months, he had no prior criminal history. And taking into account the suicide attempt he had made the previous month, Philip was clearly going through some kind of crisis and needed help, not jail time. And these arguments clearly tugged on the judge's heartstrings or whatever because the sentence he handed down to Philip for all of these crimes was two days jail time, time served. And so that was how Philip was able to just freely leave the courthouse after serving just two days in jail for all of these charges he had been found guilty of at 4 p.m. on the 7th of June, the day Courtney disappeared. At 7.30 p.m. that night, Courtney was still just chilling out at home. I'm not sure if she had heard about what the verdict was or not, but she called Lisa, her mum, at around this time, who was out at a barbecue, and Lisa told her that she and Danny were coming home and bringing a whole bunch of food for her, like chicken wings and coleslaw and all of that good stuff. And Courtney's response was, Oh my God, yes, I am freaking starving. Please hurry, which makes total sense. I know I would be wanting a whole bunch of comfort food if I had had the same day that Courtney had had. The implication in Courtney's response to Lisa in this phone call, of course, was that she was going to wait at home for Lisa and her husband, Danny, to come home and bring all this food, which is why Lisa and Danny were so surprised when they got home at 9.30 p.m. and there was no sign of Courtney anywhere other than her key, which she had left on the stove. Lisa, of course, tried calling Courtney, and this part of the story just gives me chills because Courtney didn't answer her phone, but rather than Lisa hearing her usual answering service message, which was literally just Courtney saying, this is Courtney, leave a message, at some point that night she had changed this message to, if this is Brian, keep calling back. Ryan being her new boyfriend. So this was just a bit unsettling and Lisa was already worried about Courtney, but Courtney was a full grown adult. She was 24 years old. So she decided to give her some space and some time to let them know where she was and to show up. But when the next morning rolled around and they still hadn't heard from Courtney, they still couldn't get in contact with her and they had no idea where she was, Lisa called the RNC and filed a missing persons report. And she originally got that usual spill that family members tend to get. You know, Courtney's an adult, you need to wait 48 hours before reporting her as missing. But after a lot of pushing on Lisa's part and authorities connecting the dots and realizing that Courtney had gone missing, literally just hours after testifying against her abusive ex in court, the investigation into her disappearance just hit the ground running. And there were plenty of reasons to be concerned for Courtney's safety. Police were able to see that her phone was switched off at 8.12 p.m. So not long after that phone call she had had with Lisa about the food she was bringing home from the barbecue, and they were able to see that this wasn't the battery dying or anything. The phone had manually been switched off and not been used since. Courtney also hadn't accessed her bank accounts. There was just static from her on social media, despite her usually being relatively active on Facebook. But more alarming than all of this was that there were no FaceTime calls to Oliver, something that, as we discussed, Courtney had been doing on a daily basis. And she knew how much Oliver looked forward to these phone calls. There was no way after she had fought so hard to be present in his life that she would ghost him like this voluntarily. One of authorities' first moves was to gather up and put a call out for CCTV footage of the area that day to try and get an idea of Courtney's movements. And that was when the surveillance from the Esso gas station in St. John's was discovered, placing her there at 3 p.m. Police immediately released stills from this footage, urging anyone with information about Courtney and her whereabouts to come forward. But despite a lot of calls and tips, there were no promising leads coming in for police to follow. When Courtney had been missing for one week, Jason Pike, her ex and Oliver's father, gave an interview to CBC News and he also reached out to Lisa to ask if she wanted to catch up with him and Oliver for ice cream. Having no idea at this point that Lisa fully suspected him of having something to do with Courtney's disappearance. 
months because just a few days before she disappeared, Courtney had told Lisa that Jason had suggested that they have a like sleepover with Oliver sort of as a trial because he wanted them to be a family again. And Lisa, knowing how crazy the relationship had been, had said to Courtney, Courtney, do not even think about it. And Courtney's response had been, yes, mum, I know, don't worry, it's not going to happen. And so I guess with this in mind, Lisa was thinking that maybe Courtney had turned Jason down and he hadn't taken it well. Maybe he'd flown into a rage and done something to her. So in total sleuth mode, Lisa asked Jason when they called up what he thought had happened to Courtney. And Jason said that he thought Courtney was on some drug binge and that she would show up when she was ready. But Lisa knew her daughter. She knew that there was no way that she would volunteer disappear on her son Oliver for an entire week and not FaceTime him every day like she had been. There was just no way she would do that to him. Meanwhile, Philip, just days after the news broke of Courtney's disappearance, took to Facebook to put Courtney's new boyfriend, Ryan, on blast and say that he thought Ryan had something to do with killing Courtney. Even though at this point, while the police had confirmed that they believe Courtney's disappearance was suspicious, her case was still a missing persons case, not a homicide investigation. Police during this time were still pushing for tips and information from the public and also put out a call to individuals and businesses in the area around Courtney and and Lisa's house to go back and check their CCTV footage for any sign of Courtney on the day that she disappeared. And this paid off when footage from a security camera on the front of a house on Courtney and Lisa Street, Wellington Avenue, was forwarded into the police. And this footage showed Courtney at 7.52 p.m. walking down the street alone away from her mother's house. So police now knew that Courtney seemed to have left the house voluntarily of her own accord, and they knew what direction she was headed in. Now, on the 27th of June, three weeks after Courtney's disappearance, news broke that Philip had been arrested for violating restrictions that he had in place after his arrest, specifically entering a venue that served alcohol. What really caught everyone's attention, though, was that very same day that he was arrested, police carried out a search of Philip's two-unit property that he owned with his father. And during the search, multiple things were taken away in evidence boxes and Philip's pickup truck was towed away. But Philip having a couple of drinks at a bar didn't really seem to justify this massive search being carried out on his property. So the media and the general public were instantly suspicious that police had carried out this search because they suspected Philip of having something to do with Courtney's disappearance. Philip's truck was later returned to him and police would not publicly confirm the reason behind the search, but Philip's neighbours would later say that police were asking them all kinds of questions about Courtney and whether they had seen her. And they were also conducting searches of the surrounding properties looking for any sign of Courtney. And then on the 30th of June, two days after they had searched Philip's property and 23 days after Courtney had gone missing, Police held a press conference where they broke the news that they no longer believed Courtney was just missing. They believed that she had been murdered and were now searching for her body and whoever had killed her. It was at this same press conference that police released another piece of footage they had come across of Courtney on the night she disappeared. And this footage, this time captured from a dash cam from a Metro bus, is just absolutely key in this case. This footage was from 7.54 p.m., so just two minutes after the footage that showed Courtney walking away from her mother's house. And it shows Courtney walking alongside a road very close by called Michener Avenue when this black pickup truck pulls up alongside her. And without a whole lot of verbal exchange, Courtney gets into the truck and almost before her door has even closed, the driver pulls a very abrupt U-turn and then just hightails it in the opposite direction to what Courtney had been walking. This would prove to be the last ever sighting of Courtney, her getting into this pickup truck and it taking off with her inside. And the RNC, with it being an active investigation, 
investigation were not disclosing any information about who this truck belonged to. But as soon as she saw the footage, Lisa knew whose truck it was. She had heard Courtney talk about this truck months earlier. She had seen it out front of her house and around her neighborhood. It was, of course, Philip Smith's truck, the same truck he had attempted to end his life in, the same truck he had assaulted Courtney in. And while the police were making a point of not publicly confirming that it was Philip's truck, they did say at the press conference that there was a decal on the back window of this truck of a deer head in a camouflage design. So anyone that knew Philip or had just seen footage of his truck being towed away from his property when it was searched knew that this was Philip's truck that Courtney had gotten into. So knowing everything that had led up to this point, the question we're, of course, all asking ourselves is, why did Courtney get into the truck that night? And there is a very obvious answer here. Philip was Courtney's abusive ex. He had already done terrible things to her, like beat her, send photos of her to her family, harass her. So if he pulled up in the truck beside her that night and had told her to get in, she might have been just too afraid to say no and prompt him to do something else terrible to her. But if you look at the footage, like I said, there's pretty much little to no verbal exchange and Courtney doesn't not look surprised to see Philip there at all. To me, it almost looks like she expected to see him. And this had me wondering, was this meetup planned? And then I read this interview that Lisa gave a couple of years ago, where she said that not long before she disappeared, Courtney had gone to Philip's house to pick up her stuff. And when she got there, she found her stuff out the front of Philip's house in boxes on fire. Like Philip had literally set Courtney's things on fire. But the only thing missing from these boxes was Courtney's handmade Christmas ornaments. And to say that Christmas was Courtney's favorite time of the year is just a huge understatement. Like as soon as Costco had their Christmas stock out on the shelves, Courtney was dragging her aunts down there and clearing them out. She was known to have her Christmas tree up in November. And when her family made fun of her, she, rather than getting sheepish, would be like, well, why don't you guys have your trees up yet? Like just rallying the Christmas spirit. And as someone who listens to Christmas carols and watches her favorite Christmas movies like all year round and has been known on more than one occasion to have her Christmas tree up on the 1st of November, I can relate. After Halloween, it's free game, okay? We all have our vices and mine just happens to be Christmas. Don't judge me. Anyway, Philip knew that Courtney was a Christmas fanatic. And so he had clearly held on to these ornaments to mess her up. He knew it would eat her up inside. And Lisa said that the day he was released from jail, the day Courtney disappeared, he sent Courtney a text message saying if she wanted the ornaments back, she could have them. Philip would just come pick her up and bring her to his place and they would go through it together and then he would bring her back to Lisa's. And to me, this makes the footage make so much more sense. Lisa also said that police were able to gather from these text messages between Courtney and Philip that day that it had always been Courtney's intention to return home that night. But as we know now, Courtney would never make it home. And so the RNC and Courtney's family and just a whole lot of members of the general public who had heard about the case and wanted to help out were now conducting multiple searches of multiple different areas for Courtney's body. And when we talk about searches in this case, the thing to know is that what makes Newfoundland so beautiful, other than all the lovely Canadian people living there, is its multiple vast, densely wooded areas and also so it's multiple bodies of water, like rivers, lakes, and ponds. So yes, it's beautiful, but there are also a whole lot of options for someone wanting to hide a body. So there were searches of all of these different areas going on on a daily basis, some near Courtney's house, some near Philip's house, some near where Courtney had been picked up by Philip, and some as far away as Conception Bay South, where Philip had made that suicide attempt. But all of these searches were turning up nothing. The only breakthrough there seemed to be was on the 3rd of July, when during a search of Patty's Pond, which is a 
about a 15 minute drive away from Courtney and Lisa's house, there were a bunch of items found, one of which was known to belong to Courtney, and this was handed into the police. When it came to Philip's truck, there was one other sighting of it from the night that Courtney disappeared that was reported to the police from 8.30 p.m. at Ridge Road, which was about a 15 minute drive from where Courtney had been picked up. And then there was the morning following Courtney's disappearance when both Philip and the truck were captured on surveillance footage at a gas station at about 10 a.m. And in this footage, Philip literally just fills his tank and pays for the gas. But what really piqued authorities' interest was that Philip was wearing these big green rubber boots. It wasn't until the 9th of August at Philip's next court appearance date where he appeared via video from jail because he had been in custody all of this time that he finally admitted that he had been driving the truck that night when Courtney got into it. I guess in the footage you can't really see the driver, so Philip had been denying that it had been him driving all of this time. And when he finally admitted that it had been him driving that night, police, of course, questioned him, saying, okay, so what happened to Courtney that night? Where did you take her? And he said one day that he had just dropped her off at one spot. And then when they spoke to him the very next day, he told them a totally different location. So he was really giving them nothing. At this same court appearance, Philip also admitted to calling Courtney twice that night before he picked her up, once again being in clear violation of the peace order that she had against him and a probation order that had been placed on him upon his release from court on the day that she disappeared. But are any of us surprised by now? The judge certainly wasn't surprised. He said that it was very clear that Philip had a callous disregard for court orders and that if it were up to him, he would be handing down quite a severe sentence, but he was bound to accept a plea bargain that had been worked out between the Crown Prosecutor and Philip's defence attorney for Philip to serve just 90 days jail time. And with time served, this meant that Philip only had 24 days left behind bars, and he only served 16 of them because he got out on good behaviour. And the only restriction on his release was that he was prohibited from driving for one year. Philip was discharged from the military at this point, eight years after joining the Army's primary reserves. And there was a public statement released that said that his discharge was a direct result of his charges of assault. Meanwhile, the searches for Courtney were still continuing and the ones run by Courtney's family were pretty much purely being run on the outpouring of kindness and compassion from strangers and donations from local businesses of supplies and food. But they were nearing the end of August now, meaning the colder weather was starting to set in and it was shorter days and less time for searches. And then on the 31st of October, 2017, there was a horrific turn of events that has pretty much left things in Courtney's case frozen in time ever since. At about 7 p.m. that night, Philip made a phone call to a family member and told them that he didn't want to be alive anymore and so he was going to kill himself. And the trigger here seems to be that he had been subpoenaed for yet another court appearance to sign papers to renew the peace bond that Lisa had in place against him. So this family member immediately called the RNC who quickly began searching for Philip and it was at about 3.30 a.m. the following morning that a team of sniffer dogs found Philip's body behind his parents' cabin in the woods near Bellevue Beach. The RNC originally didn't confirm how Philip had died, but in a press conference later, they said that he had committed suicide. And they also said that despite never announcing Philip as even a person of interest in Courtney's case, this entire time he had been their only suspect. At this same point, they also said that during the 100 plus interviews that they had conducted in connection with Courtney's case, that they knew there had been multiple people that had given contradictory statements that they could disprove with video and photo evidence that they had gathered during their investigation. And they believed that these people had been actively deceitful and lied while trying to cover up for Philip. 
The RNC said that their hope now that Philip was no longer around was that these people would have a change of heart and come forward and tell the truth. But to this day, this seems like something that has never happened. Immediately after Philip's death, search teams flooded the area where his body was found, hoping that maybe if, as suspected, Philip had killed Courtney, this was where he had hidden her body and he had chosen this spot to end his life because he wanted to be close to her. But just like all of the other searches before this one, these efforts tragically turned up nothing. And Philip had also left no note, meaning that any secrets he might have held in relation to Courtney's disappearance might have died with him that night. Courtney's family released a press statement not long after Philip's body was discovered, saying, our condolences go out to the family of Philip Smith. We acknowledge that no one has been charged in connection with Courtney's disappearance and murder. However, if Philip was in fact involved, we hope he left information that will lead us to her. We continue to plead with those who have information pertinent to Courtney's disappearance and murder to please contact police or crime stoppers. Our family needs to honour Courtney with the dignity of a proper goodbye. So firstly, these people have more grace in their pinky finger than I have in my entire body. And secondly, they had clearly resigned themselves to the idea that they were never again going to see Courtney alive. They were never again going to see her smile or enjoy her making them laugh. And her son, Oliver, was never again going to get a FaceTime from his mum before school. All they wanted, all they've ever wanted these past four years was to find Courtney's body and to give her the dignity of a proper burial to be able to place flowers on her grave and to have a place to talk to her and tell her how much they love and miss her. But to this day, we still don't know what happened to Courtney after she got into Philip's truck that night on the 7th of June, 2017. The search efforts for Courtney's body still continue. And every year when the warmer weather rolls around, Courtney's family urge, you know, campers, hikers, fishers, people visiting their cabins in the woods to just keep their eyes open for any sign that might lead them to Courtney's body. Over the last four years, Lisa and the rest of the family have advocated and raised money and attended rallies for groups assisting women facing domestic violence. In 2019, they also publicly supported the reintroduction of the electronic monitoring program for offenders like Philip in Canada, saying that they believed if Philip had just been ordered to wear an electronic ankle bracelet when he was released from jail, then Courtney would still be with them today. If you are watching right now and you have any information regarding Courtney's disappearance, no matter how small or insignificant it seems to you, how late it seems to come forward, forward, you have the power to finally give this family some peace and closure by anonymously contacting either Crime Stoppers or the RNC. And I will have the information you need to contact them right now on the screen and also in the description below. And that, best friends, brings us to final thoughts. And if you can't already tell, my heart is absolutely shattered by this case. I just can't imagine the heartache and pain that Courtney's family has gone through all of these years, especially her mum, Lisa, and her son, Oliver. Like, it is beyond comprehension for me. In that same interview she gave where she spoke about Courtney's handmade Christmas ornaments, Lisa said that she feels a tremendous amount of guilt for answering Philip's phone call that day that he first tried to commit suicide because she believes that if she hadn't answered that phone call or if she hadn't called his sister, then Courtney would still be alive and with us today. I know that very early on after Courtney disappeared, Jason drew a fair amount of attention with that interview he gave to CBC News and that he seemed quite eager to insert himself in the spotlight after Courtney disappeared. And I know Lisa, like we said, was suspicious of Jason early on. But as far as I'm concerned, and I think as far as majority of people are concerned, 
All signs point to Philip. I mean, Philip was Courtney's abusive ex. He was clearly pissed off at her for a number of different reasons. She had gone and gotten herself a new boyfriend while he thought they were still in love and together. She had testified against him in court the day she disappeared and she was last seen getting into his truck. So unless there's some big secret that we don't know about Jason, It just all points to Philip. Speaking of things we don't know, I feel like there has been a lot of information and evidence withheld from the public by the RNC in relation to Courtney's case, which of course sometimes is a necessity. They can't share every single piece of information and destroy the integrity of the investigation. But what is abundantly clear is that investigators found evidence that convinced them that Courtney had been murdered. And looking at the timeline of the case and the investigation, the assumption is that they found this evidence when they searched Philip's house. Lisa has actually said that she got a phone call the night that they searched Philip's property and that the lead investigator told her at about 10.30 p.m. that they hadn't found Courtney but that they knew she had been murdered. One thing authorities, of course, have shared is that they know that People have lied to them about Courtney's disappearance and actively withheld information or just straight up avoided talking to them. So we know that there are people out there today that know what happened to Courtney and have chosen not to come forward. So was there perhaps more people involved in Courtney's death than just Philip? Like this is the only thing that logically makes sense to me that would make these people remain quiet all of these years. Philip, in my opinion, I mean, I didn't personally know him, but he doesn't seem like the type of amazing guy that would inspire this type of loyalty from people to remain silent for four years after he's passed away. Like that just doesn't add up to me personally. And I just can't imagine being Lisa Courtney's mother and knowing that these people were out here that know what happened to Courtney and still refuse to come forward four years later. That answering message that Courtney put on her phone that night saying, if this is Ryan, keep calling back, still just sends shivers up my spine. And I've heard people suggest that maybe Philip made her change her answering message to that. But to me, it makes more sense that Courtney voluntarily changed her message to that, that There was something that night that made her anxious or scared and she wanted Ryan to keep calling her if she couldn't answer her phone that night, if something happened to her. But yeah, this case is absolutely heartbreaking and it's not one that we can finish up today really neatly with like a nice bow because there's no closure. Courtney's family are still in desperate need of closure. And this is something that won't happen until they find her. As usual, I would love to hear your guys' thoughts on this case. You guys have been just so phenomenal in the comments and with your support lately, especially on the last video on the Mary Kay Letourneau case. Never in my freaking life have I been so petrified to push publish on a video because it was so controversial of a case and I nearly scrapped it so many times, but I did it. And then you guys were just freaking amazing. And I just love you all so freaking much. And it truly is you guys that makes this cozy corner of ours and these hangouts what they are. Thank you once again to our beautiful best friend, Jessica, for suggesting this case. Lily, would you like to come say bye? I'm going to say bye to everyone. They're just there. I know you get confused, but they're just there. I know it's a bit confusing, but I bet most of them came here to see you today because you're so pretty. Thank you so much for hanging out with me and Lily today. As usual, we appreciate it so much. And we will be counting down the hours until we see you in the next one. Right? Bye. I've been here, but I have to stay. Flow is nice, eh? Be a person you.